wave. Today we get some rains and uh, it is uh, nothing but joyful if you ask me. So good morning. Hopefully you're enjoying the chilly weather but drive safe because the road tend to be slippery when it is raining. Well, my name is Olive Monica Najuma. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to Good Morning Uganda, a program that starts your day here on Uganda Broadcasting Corporation. And we are coming live to you from our studios here at Nile Avenue. So what do you want to know about? We have it all. We have the press re review coming up your way later on. We will have topical discussions uh, in the agenda where we will be looking at the by-election in Dokolo where UPC won by a great margin. But also we will have news internationally and locally. So stick with us. We will have a topical discussion in a newsreel. I mean, there is so much more that you can get from watching Good Morning Uganda because our mandate is to educate you, inform you and entertain you. And that we do every day from Monday to Friday, at least for Good Morning Uganda. But you know that Uganda Broadcasting Corporation always brings so much more your way. Today, I am not alone like every single day. I am with Chantal Oliver Akandinda and, of course, Jerome Paul Sonko. Now, thank you so much for being with us. Stick with us and, of course, let's start this train moving. But before we do that, good morning, Chantal. Good morning, Olive. How are you? How is the, how is the weather treating? Well, uh, the weather is treating me pretty good. I love that it has rained this morning. It started around four something. And I was like, really? Rain? You start right before we actually wake up to prepare to go to work? And, and that's Why? Really, that's really the painful part. Yes. So um, it is uh, interesting that uh, we have some rains this morning. And. Uh, well, we hope that uh, today may be chill and chilly, if you may say. It may be do that uh, so that uh, we get through this day. The heat wave really gave us some kind of uh, some trouble. And of course, there is a new study which said that uh, a heat wave can actually induce uh, stillbirths in pregnant women. So if you're pregnant, the heat wave is still ongoing despite the rains we've experienced today. So you need to take care of yourself. You need to keep yourself happy hydrated but also stick stay in places that are cool so that you can take care of yourself and uh, your baby now a lot has been happening in the world of uh, politics in this country especially opposition politics where national unity platform party has been calling for the st step down or stand down of uh, their former leader of opposition that is Matthias Mpuga now, Matthias Mpuga currently is the commissioner to parliament and there have been calls from the NUP leadership for him to stand down and leave that position, the position that they want to be given to Mitiana Municipality Member of Parliament, Francis Zake. Now, owing to that, Matthias Mpuga yesterday held a presser where he decided to address some of these issues and he had so many comments to make over this development but before we get into the development good morning jerome paul well good morning to you and uh good morning uh, dear viewer this wednesday uh does look like uh one with a lot of blessings because in the african uh, narrative if there is some rain then there are blessings coming forward and it's the holy week Surprisingly, most of um, the first few days of the month of March, or the first two weeks of March, were all filled up with hot uh, weather. But mm. now we are, getting, we are getting to experience some rains in the country. But you've mentioned something very critical with uh, the National Unit Platform. Uh, that caught my attention uh, yesterday in regards to what everyone was sharing about the feud going on uh, between the leader of the party and Matthias Mpuga. Uh, we all know that Matthias Mpuga was also the leader of opposition uh, in parliament. Uh, a, um, a spot he left for now Honorable Joel Senyoni. <coughs> and uh, it does appear like he's not willing to step down as the commissioner to, uh, parliament. A, to parliament, a wish that his party wants. And um, of course, to me, it wasn't a surprise uh, that this 
speaker did not grant uh, the national platform uh, the chance to get a new commissioner, and more so in a man like Honorable um, Francis Zake, who already has issues in Parliament. But also you, you know, mm. by, the, uh, by the speaker, mm. and uh, you realize that she's doing things according to the right way, and mm, it's yes. as if now national unity platform wants things done their way. Because it's a personal war yes. uh, that is now getting into Parliament. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of the Speaker, she did uh, release a letter addressing this issue where she said that uh, reference is made to the later dated 18th March 2024 written to uh, re wherein National Unity Platform Party communicated to the Speaker that uh, their decision to withdraw the nomination of Honorable Mathias Mpuga and replace him with Honorable Zake Francis as Commissioner of uh, Parliament. Now, in this letter, the Speaker says parliamentary commissioners are elected by Parliament by virtue of Section 2 of the Administration of Parliament, CAP 257, and Rule 11, Subsection 4, of the rules of procedure of the Parliament of the Republic of Uganda. And she said, the role of parties under the law is limited to nominating candidates for election to the Office of Commission of Parliament as stipulated in subsection 2, close section 2B. And uh, he says, she says, it provides for Nomination of the candidates for election to the commission of the four members of parliament referred to in subsection 2 shall be made by the government and opposition side. So what the speaker was saying was that uh, parties are only limited to nominating candidates, but parliament elects who becomes the commissioner. <laughs> and in, in that, what that means is that parliament can, uh, sorry, that the party National Unity Platform can now not force the hand of Parliament mm -hmm. and say, call, we, we are instructing you or directing mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. or requesting you to pull out Matthias Mpuga and replace him with Francis Zaki. Okay. You, you know, I only have one issue though with uh, how the politics is being played by the opposition party. Mm. It does <coughs> clearly show uh, that there is a great misunderstanding between Matthias Mpuga and uh, the president of the party, uh, Robert Chagulanyi. Because imagine um, someone of um, Matthias Mpuga's stature, stature rather, going on to call for a press brief at parliament mm. to address issues of the party mm -hmm. on his behalf. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, I was like, so that means anyone in a given party. I have not in any way seen a member of parliament or let's say um, a leader in the NRA movement uh, per se who goes on to create their own um, press brief because they are not happy with what their party chairman is bringing out. So I get to realize that they have a lot of these arguments and they've allowed the media to actually see all of this. Something well, they could actually hide. Well, for, mm. for, for, for Mathias Mpuga, you can say that uh, this was one, the first time he was coming out yes. to say something about uh, everything that has been all over no, social media. I think it's the media. second time. He was uh, once hosted by a local radio station um, two days after. Uh, rumor had it that he had um, taken 500 million. Uh, when it comes no, to no, being no. hosted on radio, that's that different. is done. Mm. Yes, this that is, is a different. Press conference. Now we're talking yeah. about PR where you come out mm. and it is specifically for you to inform people. Mm. And uh, when, you listen, when you listen to him, when you listen to him or even uh, if you read through uh, what he said, um, he, he says, listen, I am a co-founder of um, this party. I didn't join mm. any I, Yes, I'm a co-founder. So you cannot tell me that I have <laughs> bad intentions for the party that I founded. Mm, but I don't think he was one of the co-founders. You know why? No, he said he's because one of the founding No, he does say he's of one of the NUP. founding bosses. Mm -hmm. But when you go back to how he joined the party, many are aware he left from, uh, which other party was that? Before joining the NUP? I want to be very correct with my statements here. I think it was Democratic Party. 
where he joined yes, from because he was not part of the entire nation unit platform but he was always within the political space now you remember and, mm. you remember sorry to mm. to interject mm. but you remember that yes in as much as he was coming from another party mm. many people did actually majority mm. of mm. the members and the founding fathers of nup came from other parties true including him true uh, but you see my worry is though is when you are one of the leaders that are way older uh, than the president of the party, clearing uh, such issues in a more diplomatic way is way better. Because I did hear him um, say statements like, I only hear about uh, the party's president on a barrio. It is something that sparked up, um, you know, comic interactions on um, on the x app where people are saying so this is more like uh, a feud of uh, a man and woman who have broken up but and all you hear <laughs> is uh, the other the man will be somewhere saying me i hate that man then the woman will also be the other side saying i hate that woman but jerome paul Something like that. Uh, um, for mm. me in my view this is what i made of the presser first of okay. all he's a commissioner to parliament true secondly mm. he has been attacked publicly so the best way for him to defend himself is was supposed to be publicly. Yeah. And he did mention that. I have not had an opportunity to meet the president. All I hear is him giving interviews at barriers, rather speeches at barriers, interviews to the media about me, trying to make me look like a bad person. But if he wants us to meet and have a conversation, I am ready. And he said, I am not leaving NUP. I'm here for keeps, uh, but he did though mention mm -hmm. that uh, NUP may, uh, lacks mechanisms to solve conflict, mm -hmm. and he said he wants, he wants to, to stay around to streamline that. Yes. <laughs> All right, and uh, <laughs> you, you're right. Mm -hmm. uh, he was he was part of uh, the Democratic Party mm -hmm. that was from 2016 to 2021 when yes. he joined yes. the National Unity Platform. Mm -hmm. But then again, why would he accuse himself and say? I am one of the founding members mm. of the National Unity Platform. Please note, National Unity Platform became a party mm. after it was a pressure group. Yeah. So maybe he wasn't and part of the pressure the group. Yes. Movement. The, yes, maybe he wasn't part of the pressure group, mm. but during the formation now of the political party, that mm. is when he gets to join in. You know, maybe. my worry is he had intentions joining the party. And just like many of the Democratic Party members, many of them, because I've seen most of uh, the politicians who are trying to run away from the exact uh, NUP currently, are either members who came from DP mm. or, um, you know, UPC or any other party mm. that was there What's and realized this is the trail yeah, what, what, what's mm. important to note is that the party has internal challenges itself. Mm. And uh, the fact that they are washing their dirty linen in public um, leaves us our test in many voters' mouths. But we will be following the goings in of uh, NUP and we will be bringing you updates regarding the same. But for now, we now jump into the local news, <coughs> uh, starting with uh, Dr. Omona handing over office. Dr. Kenneth Omona Olusegun has yesterday officially handed over office to the new principal private secretary to His Excellency the President, Miss Gloria Asio Omaswa. Dr. Omona was appointed Minister of State for Northern Uganda by President Yoweri Kaguta Museveni in a cabinet reshuffle he made last week where he also appointed Miss Omaswa as the new PPS. The handover ceremony took place at the office of the president in Kampala. The secretary to the office of the president, Haj Yunus Kakande, who represented the minister for presidency, Honorable Babidi Mili Babalanda, thanked Dr. Omona for the job well done. Haj Kakande said that Dr. Omona was lucky because he has been able to get another appointment from President Museveni, describing it as a vote of confidence by the president to the former PPS. Kakande also advised the new principal private secretary to have empathy for Ugandans and put, em put emphasis on teamwork, saying that once she does that, her work will be executed very easily. 
The head of public service and secretary to cabinet, Ms. Lucy Nachobe, commended Dr. Omona for his unwavering dedication, commitment, and exemplary service to His Excellency, the President. She said, Dr. Omona has laid with, dil with diligence and he has undoubtedly re contributed to the smooth running of State House and performance of the President and his contributions will forever be remembered. The State House Comptroller, Ms. Jane Bareche, also thanked <coughs> Dr. Omona for, the, for his dedicated service to the President and Uganda as a whole and assure the new PPS of support to continuously improve State House and deliver on their mission. Now moving on to matters opposition, the former leader of opposition in Parliament, Matthias Mpuga, revealed that the National Unity Platform Party lacks internal mechanisms for conflict resolution. Mpuga comes after a month of allegations against him by the NUP party involving illicit money. Mpuga, among others, claims nepotism in NUP, vowing to institute reforms to strengthen the party. Last week, UBC engaged different political analysis, analysts who questioned the codes <coughs> of behavior of political parties in Uganda. Member of Parliament Mpuga has reiterated his position of not leaving NUP party at the same time maintaining the position of the, parliament, the parliamentary commissioner. After close to a month, the Nyendo Mukungwe member of parliament, Mathias Mpuga, has yet made a public appearance to respond to the allegations of gross abuse of public funds, which has put his image in the public eye. Mpuga was last hosted on a local radio station where he responded to the claims which were as a result of a disguised parliament exhibition. He claims the motives of the allegations are limited to defaming him for political security and waters down the use of social media to provide financial accountability. Mpuga says the public has failed to take their eyes off the claims despite illegalities used to front the matter. Member of Parliament Mpuga admitted to having shared funds under a dubbed service reward but faulted the National Unity Platform Party for the poor handling of the matter which, according to Mpuga, exposes the capacity of NUP to effect solutions to political and social challenges the country is facing. Mpuga, who has vowed not to leave the NUP party, wants to institute internal party reforms, which he claims will make NUP party a credible and competent government in waiting. This, according to Mpuga, will help to formulate internal mechanisms for conflict resolution. Away from that, the Minister for Defence and Veteran Affairs, Jacob Oboth Oboth, has appealed to the Parliamentary Committee on Defence and Internal Affairs to engage the Minister of Finance to release the money for salary enhancement for retiring officers. While presenting their ministerial policy statement and the budget Cork circular paper for financial year, 2024-25, Oboth Oboth said the ministry has a shortfall of 962 billion shillings in the area of wages. Officials from the Ministry of Defence and Veteran Affairs have appeared before the Committee on Defence to present their ministerial policy statement for the financial year 2023-24 and budget calls circular for 2024-25. The ministry has been allocated 3.8 trillion shillings of the total amount required of 7.8 trillion trillion, leaving a shortfall of 4 trillion. While presenting the ministerial statement to members of the committee, the Permanent Secretary, Minister of Defence, Rosette Ubiengoma, said their budget estimate on wage is 1.5 trillion shillings without salary enhancement, which he says is inadequate. The ministry in the area of pension and gratuity spent 90.9% of the total sum given. This low spending is attributed to pending retirees.
The Minister for Defence, Jacob Oboth Oboth, says they are retaining a huge number of officers whose retirement is due, but their retirement remains pending due to inadequate finances for their retirement packages. The issue of spending money on Uganda air cargo by UPDF was another matter of contention. Audited reports indicate that 400 million was spent every month on chartered air cargo. However, Defense Minister Oboth Oboth said government is yet to learn how to do business. The report faults the Ministry for not prioritizing research and development contrary to a worldwide practice of the military. Another area of concern was the constant allocation of 54 billion shillings to Air Force. And lastly, in our local news, the 2023 Performance Tourism Performance Report indicates Uganda's significant strides in collecting foreign exchange remittance standing at $1.025 billion in 2023 compared to $0.736 last financial year. Stakeholders say Uganda can perform much better if local tourism is boosted and infrastructure developed. The Minister of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities has released the 2023 Tourism Performance Report with significant strides in the increase of international tourism recipient of up to 56%, contributing to $1.025 billion increase from zero. $0.736 billion in 2022, representing 11% of total exports of service in 2023. Speaking at the event, the Minister for Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities, retired Major Tom Botime, stressed the need to boost local tourism and improve the infrastructure development for the sector. Well, that does it for the local news. Thank you for sticking with us. Now, Chantal Olive takes us through the international news. Now, let's cross over to Israel. According to the spokesperson of the military in Israel, Hamas Deputy Military Commander Marwan Issa was killed in Israeli strike earlier this month. There was no immediate comment from Hamas, the Palestinian group that governs the Gaza Strip. We have checked all the intelligence. Israel's Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari said in a televised statement yesterday. <coughs> Moran Issa was eliminated in the strike we carried out around two weeks ago, he said. The United States announced last week that Issa had been killed in an Israeli strike, but Israel had not confirmed his death until now. The Israeli military had previously said they had targeted Issa in an airstrike on an underground compound in central Gaza, on March 9th to 10th, Issa was a deputy to co was a deputy to Mohammed Daif, the longtime leader of Hamas's military wing in Qassam Brigades. Away from that, five Chinese nationals and a Pakistani driver have been killed after a suicide attacker rammed his explosive-laden vehicle into their convoy near Besham City in northwest Pakistan's Khyber Pakhtun. Paktunkwa province. The incident happened on Tuesday when the convoy was on its way from Islamabad to Dasu, the site of a key hydroelectric dam being constructed by a Chinese company about 270 kilometers from the capital. Our rescue team has successfully retrieved bodies of four people, whereas recovery of two more people is still ongoing. Bilal Faizi, spokesman of Rescue 1122 Group in Kaiba, told news agencies. Rescue officials say the vehicle carrying the Chinese nationals fell in a gorge after the blast and at least two bodies were badly burned, making their identification difficult. No armed group has so far claimed responsibility for the attack. The Chinese embassy in Islamabad or Chinese foreign ministry in Beijing has not commented on the incident yet. Back to Africa, a Nigerian court has sentenced a Chinese businessman to death after being found guilty of murdering his girlfriend, Umu Kulthum Sani, in 2022. Frank Geng Kwarong also was, dis was discovered in her room after, 
after having stabbed her several times. The killing of the 22-year-old university student shocked Nigerians and the case was closely followed. Death sentences are rarely carried out in Nigeria. Kwarong has 90 days to appeal against the verdict. Speaking on behalf of the family, the victim's brother Sadiq Sani described the sentence of death by hanging handed down by the court to Kano as justice. He said, he said that whoever kills anyone deserves to be killed too. We thank God for showing us this day. I pray my sister's soul continues to rest in peace, he told news agencies. Her family remembers the young agriculture undergraduate as kind and jovial. And lastly, matters climate. Uh, climate change threatens to call time on the great British print, but scientists are working with the brewing industry to help save it. Hopes gives bitter its test but the plant doesn't doesn't like the hotter drier conditions we've experienced in recent decades and production has plummeted researchers in kent are isolating hope genes in the hope of producing more climate change resilient varieties they also want to produce more intense flavors that are now becoming popular without it the british pint is going to die off danielle whelan of the shepherd Nam brewery said of the work we are just going to be importing beer and we won't have the culture that goes with it anymore warmer drier conditions have also affected the trademark bitter flavor bitter flavor hopes gives beer and the worry is that because of climate change the problem is only going to get worse eddie gad the head of the head brewer at the ramsgate brewery say that it was already having an impact and that's it for climate news and what is happening across different parts of the world. Now coming back from different parts of the world and climate news, Jerome Paul Sonko now shares what the press has for us this morning. Well, the new vision is highlighting, uh, I'm going nowhere. Uh, NUP has no powers to recall Mpuga, uh, Speaker Rita uh, The tourism earnings hit 4 trillion Ugandan shillings. Uh, that is still with the new vision. Uh, then, furthermore, Japan gives 24 billion Ugandan shillings for hospitals. Now, in the other news also, President Museveni receives message from the Central African Republic President. And UNEB at subjects examinations condensed. That is also with the new vision and uh, the bigger headline. And also a pictorial of um, some of the tourist, uh, tourism activities in the country is at the front page of today's new vision. Now, uh, looking at the Daily Monitor, noisy prayers land pastor in police cell. Uh, which pastor is that? Uh, read about it in the Daily Monitor today. Uh, then, impunity, protests in Gulu City over fuel station being constructed in wetland. Pictorial of uh, the construction works ongoing in Gulu. Uh, then, national unit platform at a crossroad over Bobby Mpuga standoff. Read about that still with the Daily Monitor. And, and then... You can also read about um, the Senegal polls. Faye, from unknown jailbird to Africa's youngest president. Uh, read about him, still with the Daily Monitor. Now, in the other news, government plans to increase enrollment in traditional schools. How is that going to be done? Find out more in today's Daily Monitor. Now, crossing the borders to Kenya, one president, two first ladies. Meet Senegal's Basir Faye. And uh, you can also... I read about half of young Kenyans would rather start businesses than seek employment, according to a new study. Then job losses uh, as 140 state farms to go. The government President Ruto announces plans to shut down loss-making state corporations. And that is also in the Daily Nation. Now in the review, rent shoker for civil servants living in government houses. As in sport, motorsport, Ndulele, uh, shakedown gets the iconic... Uh, WRC Safari Rally going. Then audit reveals grim reality of maternity hospitals in counties. That and more is with the Daily Nation. Now lastly from our press review, the Citizen newspaper from Tanzania, the private sector, how Vision 2050 can be attained. Then in the Rising Woman Citizen series, Jamila fights for women in Zanzibar's legal system. Then also, alarm as Lake Victoria fish stocks plummet by 35%. 
as well as Air Tanzania Company Limited's newest plane arrives home. The pictorial is also at the front of the citizen. Now, international reaction countries want swift execution of UN ceasefire vote as two Tanzanian farms among 30 BRT applicants. That and more is with the citizen today. And well, that is it from our press review this morning. Now, we will take a short break and when we come back, we will be having our newsreel. But before that, one president, two first ladies, I wonder how this is going to pan out. Very interesting development. But you're still watching Good Morning Uganda. We'll be right back. We're leaving you with courage up. I'm not alone. Live from UPC Studios in Kampala, this is Good Morning Uganda. Kaiba Paktunkwa province. The incident happened on Tuesday when the convoy was on its way from Islamabad to Dasu, the site of a key hydroelectric dam being constructed by a Chinese company about 270 kilometers from the capital. Our rescue team has successfully retrieved bodies of four people, whereas recovery of two more people is still ongoing. Bilal Faizi, spokesman of Rescue 1122 Group in Kaiba, told news agencies. Rescue officials say the vehicle carrying the Chinese nationals fell in a gorge after the blast and at least two bodies were badly burned, making their identification difficult. No armed group has so far claimed responsibility for the attack. The Chinese embassy in Islamabad or Chinese foreign ministry in Beijing has not commented on the incident yet. Back to Africa, a Nigerian court has sentenced a Chinese businessman to death after being found guilty of murdering his girlfriend, Umu Kulthum Sani, in 2022. Frank Geng Kwarong. Peak of the day on UBC. Every Wednesday, 10 p.m. on your public broadcaster. <laughs> was brought to you by MTN Momo Pay is the easy way to pay. Dial star 165 star 3 hash or use the MTN Momo app. You don't need cash. MTN Momo Pay is safe and free. Live from UPC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. And it is the hour of our news bureau. Thank you so much for sticking with us. My name is Olive Monica Najuma, here with Chantal Oliver Kandinda and Jerome Paul Sonko. Now, these two uh, colleagues of mine, I, I, maybe even myself, uh, mm. qualify to be called the youth mm. of uh, Uganda. Yes. And uh, <laughs> Chantal, we'll get to that. Mm? Mm. So, yes. even, uh, 
Okay. Uh, are you saying I'm not a youth? Uh, no, I said <laughs> you qualify. <laughs> anyway, so in qualifying to be youth, there have been several youth empowerment programs by the government so that they get you, the youth uh, to a level of financial independence. But why are many government programs are not effective? Why are they not effective? Why are they not successful? The intention behind some of these programs is pretty good. Empower the youth because 70% of Uganda's population is comprised of the youth. And because of that, we have uh, many unemployed youth in the country. Universities are always churning out several uh, graduates every single year, pretty much every single month, because we have many universities. But most of them are aiming for the job market that doesn't have enough positions waiting for them. So because of this, the government has put out, uh, has put out empowerment programs that like the Youth Livelihood Fund and uh, to make sure that they empower the youth. But why are they not successful? Why are they struggling? Uh, it is said that uh, youth empowerment programs play a crucial role in shaping the future of nations by harnessing the potential of young people and equipping them with the skills and opportunities that they need. So it still brings us to the question, why are they not successful? And what can be done to ensure that the programs that we already have can actually be used to bring the youth from the poverty that they are facing, from the unemployment that they are facing, to a level of being job creators, to a level of, of helping to advance Uganda's economy. Now, uh, Jerem Paul. Hmm. We've had uh, different uh, youth empowerment programs, uh, the Youth Livelihood Fund. Right now, we even have uh, the parish development model. Mm -hmm. It's not entirely dedicated to the youth, but still, because they can the gain from mm -hmm. it. Yes. So, in your opinion, why are we not successful? The intentions are good, the programs are magnificent, but we are still facing challenges. Uh, I think... When you look at the challenges the young people themselves are facing, the mm. government has failed to look into them directly. Mm. Okay. Why I'm saying directly, you realize that most of the challenges include access to quality education. And the quality education I'm saying here is not simply going to class and studying. Because when you look at most of the countries uh, that are being given as examples where youth programs are active, countries like Singapore, uh, you, you get to realize that uh, even China, we've seen videos of China, how students go practical right from education. Mm. So that is the level of the quality that we need. Because when you go to the job market, you want someone to enter when, they've already, uh, when they already know what they, they, you know, they studied. But surprisingly, today the youth go and learn on job. Then they, and this is where the government is actually uh, failing short. And then the other challenge among the youth as I'm getting into you know, what you asked earlier, you realize that they have no access to, you know, to capital or initial capital, startup capital. And when you look at some of this, the government is failing, uh, falling short to enabling the young people to access resources that they need. Isn't this mm. the rationale mm. of the, 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 the funds, let's say the Youth Livelihood Fund mm. and uh, the Parish Development Model, isn't the rationale to give the youth funds? Yes, it is. But when you look at the access, mm. you know, the most important bit about everything is the access. How accessible are these funds? Because you realize that uh, most of uh, the young people today, for example, when the, uh, the Youth Livelihood Program kicked off, 10 years back, mm. many were still teenagers. Many were, you know, still in school. And they were waiting to get out of school and maybe have hope of um, starting up. And with our education system, it, uh, it is rather not supportive to someone who is skilling up. But again, I, I want to give, um, you know, kudos to the government that there has been more eff effort when it comes to empowering vocational training institutes. Mm. These have actually created room for the young people to wake up. But then there's also an element of mentorship and training. When you look at some of these programs, for example, the Youth Livelihood Program, which has a fund where the youth can go and uh, get money mm. to start up something, many of them lack mentorship. 
and the training, the necessary training on how to utilize these funds. That, you know, uh, Joram with a group of, uh, you know, my fellow innovators, agents, we've gone to the government through the Youth Livelihood Program to seek for fund support. Afterwards, you realize that the lack of mentorship makes it even difficult. Because if I'm to take you through a report that was released last year, it is actually showing uh, that the government has lost about 129 billion that was lent to the young people, which shows that 129 billion clearly gives you an image that the money was not put into proper use. By the youth, by the youth themselves. By the youth and themselves. And that goes and back to the training, the training before and the mentorship, money is given. That someone is given the money, mm. but obviously because they're excited. You know, young people, you're excited, you had no job, you want to start up something for your own self. At the end of the day, you have no one to give you direct mentorship on, uh, let's say, a business plan. How are you going to utilize the money? How can you make this money grow mm. at the initial stage? And you realize that in the 10 years that the Youth Livelihood Program is, is actually you know, marking this year, mm. many of these challenges uh, go back to the fact that the youth cannot even pay back. Because they are not having the money now. How mm. about the question of um, what happens after? You've, mm. uh, the initial training happens mm. and then the funding is given. Mm. Is there more support that is extended to the youth? Or once the first funding is given and the training, that's it? I believe the way it was structured, it was meant to help the youth. Um, uh, it was meant to help the youth uh, figure it out in a way. Because as an individual, you could not go and access that money. You had to be, in, you had to be a collection of youth to mm -hmm. go and apply for that money and get it. And that's what they were calling uh, the, uh, the youth interest groups. Mm -hmm. So you had to organize yourselves into interest groups and then fill forms, then apply for the money and get it. So that means as a group, it, is, it was believed that you would be in a position to figure it. I've not heard of any mentorship that was done especially during the course of, uh, of, of running these people's businesses. However, you asked a question, mm. why do we see these programs not yielding according to what they're set up for? One, if I'm going to have to pay back that money, as a youth, I'm likely to be scared to go and get that money from the, from, from the beginning. Mm. So some could have shunned the process because there was an element of paying back. And after that, as you could tell, some, most of them mm. were not able to pay back. About 61,000, over 61,000 million US dollars are not paid back mm. from just, just in Kampala mm. here for those that were able to access the money. And in 2017, for example, the Youth Livelihood Program and the Youth Livelihood Fund was put on hold. The disbursement of money was put on hold because of the failures to pay back. Remember, this money was supposed to be paid back, so that then they, they disburse to others, other, yes. or they keep disbursing to others. Because but it gives them a track record of how Yes, how businesses are, are faring. Exactly. Now, you realize that one, if those who are failing to, if one, the project, the disbursement of money is paused. That means it's as good as we've closed shop. Mm -hmm. Two, there's an element of paying back, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, you, you know, you're looking at the, the investments, most of the groups that were named welding, carpentry, Skills. Yes, those skills were majorly the ones. Yes, the ones that were that that were looked at or given priority when mm. it came to those that, that were getting the money. But the question is, how is government also prepared to help those young businesses that are cropping up? You might find you're given the money, yes, but at the back of their minds, there is no, there is no, there is no conversation of, are we giving them tax exemptions? For example, are they going to be getting materials that they use at a discounted rate wherever they go to buy? Mm. So all those questions should have been put into consideration before we, you know, before setting up a whole program. Mm -hmm. And I think those are some of the reasons that have made uh, programs not achieve the purpose for which they are created. You know, there's also an element of, of the partnership. A partnership between, let's say, people who are already active in business. Mm -hmm. um, maybe NGOs supporting the young people. Well, some NGOs have actually been very supportive. But they've only been supportive in a way that they are benefiting more from uh, the young ones or the youth. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, believe it or not, from our own you know, point of view, it becomes very difficult if you're young in the employment world 
especially in the business in the business world where you're starting up you're right from school whether it is a high school or whether it's a technical institute you're just starting up you need some serious partners who are going to help you reach out to the market for example if someone is a carpenter um, maybe a 23 year old carpenter and a group of carpenters within the same age bracket from 22 to 25 it is not easy to find market in that age bracket mm -hmm. because first of all you do not know who to reach out to first you don't know how business operates do you know how to but, market mm, your product you don't know so this is the kind of mentorship at times that is uh, becoming a challenge to these young people and that's why mm. uh, it is still uh, that that's mm. why the question still lingers of is this a short-term or long-term interventions that the government is coming up with because you're giving them money you're giving mm -hmm. them probably the initial training, but how is this sustainable exactly. in the long term? And are you even following up to know why are they failing mm -hmm. to get back that money? Mm -hmm. Because I think this is where, because as you're cutting short um, or you're holding the release of fund, mm -hmm. then that means you have to go back and ask, why is it that we've released, let's say, 100 billion Ugandan shillings? Mm -hmm. If we've released all that money, why is it that the the different youth interest groups that we have actually dispersed this money to are not making any development with Do it. you also mm. think that probably the reason why the mm. money, first of all, is not paid back mm. goes beyond the youth and goes back to the mm. grassroots of... Uh, is there something that probably the government is not doing right where it, from the beginning? Because if, let's say, you're a bank mm -hmm. and you're going to lend Sonko money, there has to be checks and balances yes. that you put in place. Does the government have these? Why is it that all this money goes, because in my opinion, the money is more or less going to waste. True. Because if you can't get mm -hmm. it back, then you're creating another problem. Then you cannot even help Because you can imagine others. 129 billion, that has completely gone to waste. Yeah. Mm. So where is the gap? Monitoring. I, I think the monitoring of, of, of knowing that you've given, let's say, 20 youth interest groups after a period of one month, are you monitoring to see what they are using it for? Mm. Uh, you know, there was a report that was released, um, I think, last week, that many young people uh, you know, have turned betting into a livelihood. Yes. And betting companies are earning millions and millions. And young people are losing are and losing staying out. unemployed. Yes. Staying unemployed, getting addicted to the same. So you realize that many of the young people are putting money into things that at times are not developmental to them because they want quick money. Mm. And it goes back to the monitoring that you've given them money. Well, for you, all you want is maybe after a period of this time, I want this money back. I'm going, to, I'm going back to ask for the money. Doesn't that but show you that know, uh, mm. internally, uh, and now I'm talking about the implementers mm. of mm. these programs, internally a lot has to be checked. Yes. Because it does not stop at your disbursing. Then you sit back and expect that the money is going to be sent back. These are youth we are talking about. Oh, in brackets, desperate youth, some of them. And by the time, by the time someone is in that state, you don't know what they could do with that money. Also, uh, also before we go into the money, hmm. is it, um, I see, for instance, uh, the public, uh, the, the private sector foundation has this, um, has this new initiative where they are giving women-led businesses yes. trainings. Yes. So should the focus be mainly on giving the youth money or, or first of all on training them regarding how to run a business, financial discipline, and then you disburse the money? Because um, Sonko did note that some of them get money and they get excited. They remember the other new balance should they need to buy. They remember the loafers. <laughs> you get. So should we probably go back to the drawing table and say instead of this busing money, money is needed. But you've had many successful people say that you actually don't need money to start a business. Yes, but yes. you need key information and training to run a business. What is your say, Shanta? I, I definitely agree with you because uh, if we... If, if, if I don't know what to use, what, what, what I don't, if I don't know of what importance what I've been given, or if I can't attach a certain value to what I've been given, or if I don't know what to use it for, I'm going to misuse it. Mm -hmm. And that is what I think the biggest problem was when it came to the youth. They didn't know what to use it for. But let's also go to the detail of how much was this bus to the youth. Interesting. How much? Yes, because now that's the detail 
that will make someone think, but now with 500,000, or because we are supposed to be in groups. Mm -hmm. So if say we're given a certain amount of money and we, and we divide it according to the number that we are, mm -hmm. how much do we have left? And can it actually set up a business? Well, it depends. And a business person will say you can still mm. start a business with 500,000 yes, if you have the proper you know, knowledge. You mentioned the comprehensive yes. approach mm. of making sure that you're mentoring, training, giving them Before you give business them education. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at most of the trainings that PSFU is actually giving to the, the women in business, there is no money attached. Yes. These women are showcasing their businesses. Business, yes. it's how They're to bringing to them business successful marketed. business women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How are you doing it? So you can easily see that we have successful youth or young people who have done it in business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, bringing them closer to these young people. Because remember, the good thing about <coughs> these, um, these funds is that they're not giving them to one individual. They're giving them to a group. Mm -hmm. And which clearly shows uh, them that the government has realized that if you are a group, the chances are you can easily come up with, you know, something good because you're many. Mm -hmm. And but also, mm. uh, sorry to cut you short, Sonko. Do, are you aware that we can come together, mm. Olive, Chantal, Sonko, Robert, Godwin, and we say let's go apply for this money? It's an interest group, right? Yes. Mm. Let's go apply. Or then mm. when we get the money, divide it according to ourselves. Mm. Everyone takes their what? Because uh, yeah, the common oh, interest true. is getting the money, mm. and that is why I think we needed to have checked these things aside from the trainings that we have done mm. what is the role of you coming together as a group mm. because these, by i the don't way, think the youth uh, understand some of them actually come together after years of unemployment and they Thank feel uh, since we've been unemployed for all this while mm. Mm. let's go and at least benefit because most of the the young, even the people who have been going to the pdm when you look at the, the creation of the ghost circles some people created these circles simply because they feel like let's benefit co from the from government our, uh, from, no they, say they, 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 they actually say from our taxes from our, uh, exactly that's what they say so yes. they don't know the entire mm -hmm. reason as to why these funds are put in place also goes mm. back down to sensitization mm. because that means these youth did not understand the reason as to why in two, in 2001 the youth uh, the youth uh, the youth livelihood uh, no the reason as to why the the first of all the youth projects were put in place and the reason as to why the funds were put in place the youth do not understand that and that is why you will have such conversations among them let's also eat some of government's money but, but also, also okay. Okay. Olive, wow. in a minute just, in just a minute okay. mm. you also realize that the youth participation in the decision making is also limited. Stakeholder involvement. Who is? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Mm. Who mm -hmm. is representing the youth? Because I can sit. I will use an example mm -hmm. as a, a mom. I will sit with my husband, mm -hmm. and we will decide for the children. But mm -hmm. some of our children are teenagers, right. and uh, probably what we think works for the teenagers mm -hmm. may not necessarily work. For them. Mm -hmm. work because for you're them. creating so, a model for the young people but you're and not, the you're young not person. having the young people you don't have you an, a, 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 mm -hmm. an experience of what it means to be young today exactly. yes you were young before mm -hmm. but young today especially you know, when you're young, young when you don't era. have you don't <laughs> have a, a job Hang, yeah. uh, young when you you've not completed school mm -hmm. uh, young when you've let's say you know had no parents at young all these are when all different AI is not threatening your job mm -hmm. exactly <laughs> so you, you you're looking at different dynamics of a mm. young person mm. in a new era mm. so there are lots of things that need to be really looked at yeah. but also okay mm. you're um, giving me money mm. to invest in either saloon or craft or music or something what if i want to proceed with no now here's mm. the thing the, for instance in uh, the the youth livelihood program was put in place to mainly support uh, uh, students that are in the um, what is it? The, the skills. The skills. Mm. Exactly. Uh, yes. For example, vocational. Pro, vocational, vocational and, and yes, whatnot. Yes. So yes, when you ask, what if I want to be something else, then that is not a program for you. But there have been other programs mm. that have been put in place. Now, as we wind, it is very, uh, it is very prevalent that uh, the, the programs are quick fixes in a way. So what can government do as we close, Chantal? What should government do to ensure that these programs actually serve the purpose for which they were made? Number one, let's make sure in the very beginning the youth understand why these projects are being put in place. Number two, let's equip them with the knowledge and information to enable them carry forward sustainably these projects that are being put in place.
All right. Mm. And Jerome Paul Sonko, I'll ask you the same question. Mm. What, how best can the government ensure that these programs that they have come up with to enable the youth get out of poverty serve the purpose for which they were made? Youth participation in um, decision, decision making. Decision -making. <laughs> mm. You know, even when um, the new minister uh, in charge of, minister of state in charge of Youth and, youth and, uh, and, and uh, the children, mm. the children, and affairs. children affairs. Yes, uh, Honorable now Honorable uh, Balam mm. uh, came out and revealed that he's going to ensure that the youth voices are heard. Yes, because when you look at uh, that statement alone, mm. it shows that you want them to participate mm. practically. Mm. So that is one thing that we really need to focus on. That as much as we are mentoring them, but let them also participate in decision making. Let them contribute to what they think is good mm. for their generation. And my entire element is on the generation because generations are now different. Yes. And, di and challenges are different. So that to me would um, simply be a good way to start. Well, you've heard it from uh, my colleagues. And of course, this conversation is a conversation that we need to continue having. As the youth, when you get this money, what are you using it for? Because uh, it's not going to take government to come from its place to come and tell you what to do all the time. But when you're given mentorship and given funding, what are you using the money for? Ensure that you use the money for what it was given for. And that's the only way you're going to get yourself out of poverty. Also, it's important to note that as the youth we need to be uh, learning and learning some more so that we make ourselves better. Well, this is still Good Morning Uganda. Irene Allen Namisango is coming up next with the GMU Tourism Express. Stick around. Live from UPC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Nyati Motion Pictures brings you Duko Pamoja, a documentary film about our unity as Ugandans and Africans. Bunyoro would have simply created an East African community that we are looking for today. The rulers of Bunyoro are actually Luos. We people who live across the Nile, we are so related from our myth or from just the Nile. We are the same people and genetically we are even the same people. We are similar people. We are one. Pamoja, we are one. Use that word, Pamoja. Pamoja. Premiering every week from 3rd February to June 2024 at the National Theatre and Indere Centre. Daily screenings are from 4th February to June 2024 at Ham Cinemax and the National Theatre. To get a ticket, call 0778-787-660. Tuko Pamoja? A new dawn on Behind the Headlines with me, Timothy Nyangweso, every Wednesday live in our studios in the heart of Kampala, we have conversations that have analysis, explanation, but not every truth is fact, and not every fact is truth. Every Wednesday, 10 p.m. on your public broadcaster. All on your public broadcaster, UBC, inspiring Uganda. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda.
There is no doubt that tourism is one of the fastest growing industries in Uganda, but not only in Uganda, also the world as a whole. So when you look at even the recent numbers that we had in the recently released Ministry of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities uh, presentation performance, tourism performance, you see that the numbers, we are really rising higher from the tourist arrivals from 814 arrivals to more than 1.2 tourists coming into the country and you also see that the domestic tourists were also still maintaining their their position or place at 86 point something percent meaning that eight out of 10 tourists in the hotels in the destinations were ugandan so it shows that there are really good trades in the tourism industry that we are promoting with several campaigns that are going on when you look at the innovations and technology that are coming up, when you look at the Explore Uganda campaigns, and so many other initiatives that Uganda Tourism Board is really working hard to see that it promotes Uganda as a universally acceptable tourism destination. So there is a lot that we need to do because when you look, as much as we are really making good strides, when you look at the global, when we look at the bigger picture, the global population is at 8, point, is at eight billion people. And if we are only bringing in 1.2 million people, are we really making it our, are we really doing our best? I think there is room for expansion and for a better, a, a better business in the tourism industry. We have room for expansion because they are really bigger numbers that we can attract to the country. And look at the country like Uganda, we have the best the most beautiful weather in the world and when we say this someone might not believe until they come and experience this weather when you look at we have the source of the Nile in the country we have mountain gorillas more than half of the remaining population of the mountain gorillas is in Uganda so I feel if there are better policies that are implemented we can really attract more investors into the tourism sector to improve the infrastructure, the accommodation facilities, and so many other things of gaps where we need to cover in the tourism sector. We can attract investors to come and invest in the tourism sector so that together we promote the sector and also make it sure that we are able to earn more foreign exchange earnings from the sector because when you look at other countries, actually, in Tanzania, I think the numbers that we get for a whole year, the tourists we get for a whole year, they only get them like in a week. But they're only our immediate neighbors, so we can really do more. There is a lot of potential and room for expansion for our tourism sector. However, today the program is really for people that are really aspiring to join the tourism sector. You've always wanted to join the sector. You want to invest. Maybe you want to be a hotelier, conservationist. You want to be a marketer. Anywhere, tourism has room for everyone. But you're wondering, where do I start from? What do I do? Where do I go? So today we are basically going to look at the offices, the very important offices that we have in the tourism sector that are really laying the very strong backbone of the tourism sector in the country. And first up is the Minister of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities. Now your first question is where are they located? They are located at Renzo Records and a Minister of Tourism is responsible for, for uh, implementing or setting up the policies, enacting policies, uh, strategies that are going to promote, preserve and protect Uganda's tourism, that is wildlife, cultural heritage. So according to their website, you see that that is their role and Minister of Tourism has other organizations, government organizations that are under it. So it manages all these organizations, that is Uganda Tourism Board, Uganda Wildlife Conservation and Education Center, there is UHTTI, that is the Uganda Tourism Hotel and Hospitality Institute in Jinja. There is Uganda Wildlife Authority, the Uganda Museum, so many other government bodies that are doing works in the tourism sector that are under Minister of Tourism. So Minister of Tourism takes or manages all these bodies, but is also uh, supposed to make sure that it implements or it makes up policies and strategies that are going to promote Uganda's tourism as well as preserving our culture heritage and wildlife conservation. So that is their mandate according to their website. Uh, when you, ca you can also go to their website and get more information about the Ministry of Tourism and their mandate and roles. The next body is Uganda Tourism Board. Now this one is mandated. It was actually formed in 1994 under the Uganda Tourism Board Institute. And this is, is supposed or its mandate is to promote 
and market Uganda as a viable tourism destination, both internationally and locally. So anything that is about uh, marketing Uganda, positioning Uganda, or even marketing the, uh, brand Uganda, it is Uganda Tourism Board. So Uganda Tourism Board also has other roles that is supposed to take on. For example, if you want to have a tour company in Uganda, you should know that you're supposed to be licensed by Uganda Tourism Board. All tour operators are supposed to be licensed by Uganda tour operators. So you need to go to their website or go to their offices. They're located at Lugogo House. Uh, so you can go there, Lugogo Bypass at Lugogo House. So you can pass by, get more information. If you want to get a hotel, you still have to be licensed. And they've also been doing the recent hotel star rating. So if you're a hotelier or you own a hotel and you want, to, you want your hotel, hotel to be rated, you can also think about visiting their offices and get more information about that. Yeah, again, the next body is Uganda Wildlife Authority. So this one is also another body under Ministry of Tourism, but this ministry, uh, Uganda Wildlife Authority is supposed or is mandated to conserve the wildlife and the protected areas that we have in Uganda. So UWA manages all the protected areas that we have in the country. Those are the 10 national parks, the 12 uh, game reserves, and all other protected areas that we have in the country. It is UWA that is responsible for them. But as a tour operator, I will tell you, where basically can you engage with Uganda Wildlife Authority? So if you want all the permits, gorilla permits, stream trekking permits, they are all attained at the offices of Uganda Wildlife Authority, but also information about the park entrances, what you need to go into the park, where, where, where do you book from, all this information is at the UWA website, just like you can see on my screens, and also you can get more information at their offices, they are located uh, at Plot 7, Chura Road, uh, it is close to the Uganda Museum, just after the Uganda Museum, there are the UWA offices, so you can find time, go get more information as you think about joining the tourism industry. So another body that, it is not actually a body, but another very important office that you need to know is the Kampala Tourism Information Center. <laughs> so this is located at Sheraton Hotel here in Kampala. It was set up by KCCA and Uganda Wildlife Authority and the information center is there to provide all the reliable information, all the relevant information for Uganda's tourism mostly for the Kampala destinations. If you're in Kampala, you have a day off, you have maybe hours off, where do you need to go, what do you want to do, you can go to the Kampala Tourism Information Center and you get all the information that you need. They can connect you to a tour guide, they can connect you to a tour operator, but you can also get your go reserve your gorilla permits from this Kampala Information Center. If you don't want to go outside the center, the Kampala State Center, to go to Uwa, you can reserve your gorilla permits and get information about other national parks at the Kampala Information Center. So the next one in line is the Uganda Tourism Association. So this it's, is it's an umbrella body for the private area sector area and the tourism sector. So this segment. has different associations Handles. under it. The associations, we are not mentioning it them yet because we are still making more research about them to see whether they are really working together with the government, are they licensed, but there are other associations under the Uganda Tourism Association. But if you need to join, whether you're a hotelier, to operator, to a guide, you can go to Uganda Tourism Association and they guide you properly because it is the umbrella body that represents the private sector of the tourism sector. So uh, you can go to Uganda Tourism Association. They are located, their offices at Capital Shoppers, Nakawa. So another body uh, is the last one actually is Buganda Heritage and Tourism Board. So this is in charge of all the, it is supposed to promote, protect and preserve the cultural heritage of Buganda, making uh, strategies to promote the Buganda uh, tourist attractions like the royal tombs, but also make sure that the facilitation is in time for the people that take or manage this, these sites. So, Buganda Heritage and Tourism Board, if you want to know anything about Buganda's tourism, that is the office for you. That is it that we had for you today. I guess it was really good information for you. If you want to know more about Uganda's tourism or join the sector. And the tip for today is, please, if you want to join the sector, make sure that you go to any of these offices, visit them, don't be scared. They are really free and open to help you in whatever way that you want. So this is the time for you to start up whatever you wanted to have in the tourism sector. I am Irene Alena Misango, Uganda Uncovered, and this is the GM Tourism Express. 
Coming up is the business update with Joram Paul Zonko. Well, I was here asking uh, Alan about the Uganda Uncovered. And I think you can uh, follow it up as well to get more information about tourism investment, tourism attractions in Uganda, and pretty much getting to understand how tourism in Uganda really works and what entails the entire landscape of Uganda's tourism sector. I am Joran Paul Sonko, though. It's time for business news this morning. And I'm starting off from uh, the world of agriculture. And this time around, looking at it from an angle of a Ugandan secondary school uh, that walked away with a regional agriculture innovation award. This is something that many of us really aspire to achieve. Getting, you know, getting awards of such magnitude, not only within the country, but across the region. And I can tell you, even the president would be very proud of the fact that Ugandan schools are making these strides right through agriculture because as we push for agriculture getting into uh, the commercial sector or commercializing uganda's agricultural sector all we want is seeing such innovations being recognized and rewarded now the school in question that i'm talking about is uh, rise and shine secondary school which is based in Nintinda, emerged the win of an innovation award after shrugging off competition from 12 other groups across the east african region and uh, multiple countries within the african continent that took part of this agricultural um, shop uh, showpiece now a panel of judges were in awe of ugandan integrity uh, leaving them with no option but to declare the rise and shine secondary school from tinder as the winners of this agriculture innovation award now in a groundbreaking you know display of innovation uh, the team imperial tech from rise and shine in tinder emerged as the year's regional uh, champions of the Sahara Steamers uh, Grand Demo Competition, according to uh, the statement that was released by the Daily Monitor yesterday. Now, the contest is now in its second year, I was, uh, its second edition, and is organized by the Sahara Group Foundation and Asharami Uganda in collaboration with STEM Cafe. This year's program was aimed at fostering innovation, creativity, and enhancing excellence in innovation and of course looking at what students can come up with when you look at uh, the diversity of innovation and then how many countries are skilling their citizens when it comes to the curriculum you look at universities you look at technical institutes world over many of them are emphasizing on the idea of innovation and encrypting technology in agriculture why because it is the generation that we are living in today. So if you want to improve, yesterday we were talking about agricultural inputs here in one of the business reports and realizing how many farmers in Uganda are falling short of uh, making more money because of uh, the failure to have the right full agricultural inputs. And when you look at the generation that we're in, we are competing on a world scale of, um, of, a, of, of market. And the market internationally seeks for standards. So that means you have to meet various standards if at all you're to earn great, um, you know, if at all you are, you are to earn a sustainable market and also be able to get more money off it. Countries like the Netherlands, Germany, you look at countries like China, Japan, many of these countries that people don't look at as um, generally countries that are agriculture, uh, agriculture they make more money simply because they have the right methods. And seeing a school 
with such innovations, it is something that you can easily be proud of as a Ugandan. And of course, here at UBC, we say kudos uh, to Rise and Shine, a secondary school in Tinder, uh, for winning that accolade. I think it's a good starting point for any other school in Uganda uh, reaching out in uh, such a way. And well, how about that for our farmers, by the way? Because as the parish development model, one of the pillars of the parish development model is to ensure that commercial agriculture is a thing for many of the Ugandans. Now let's head to Ethiopia uh, from our business report away from the country because uh, a week ago I did give you a report on an update where students, not only students by the way, account holders were able to get money uh, after a failed system in the bank. Now Ethiopia's CBE bank has recovered 10 million dollars taken during the technical glitch uh, that transpired. When you look at this, um, this CBE is Ethiopia's largest bank and uh, it revealed that it recovered almost three quarters of the 14 million US dollars uh, that was lost in a glitch. Now uh, 14 million US dollars that is approximately 12 million um, Great Britain pounds that was lost during that technical glitch where many uh, account holders in CBE were able to withdraw money that they didn't even have on their accounts. So they would easily go and access money and the bank ended up losing close to 14 million. Now, according to new details coming in from the CBE, they have revealed that they were able to recover 10 million off the 14. Now, the head of the Commercial Bank of Ethiopia, that is the CBE, Abe Sano, uh, revealed on Tuesday about 10 million dollars uh, was recovered. He revealed that thousands of customers returned the cash voluntarily and Sanon warned those who had not will face criminal charges for taking money that does not belong to them. Most of the money was withdrawn by university students, according to a statement. And on 16th March, uh, March rather, uh, when I came here and actually revealed to you about this technical glitch, many students became really rich, you can easily imagine if you're a student at university without any plan whatsoever to earn some good money, then a technical glitch happens and you have an account with a given bank in Uganda. All you have to do at times is you go out, rush and withdraw money. But well, many uh, due to fear of being imprisoned or arrested, uh, voluntarily returned that money according to the CBE's statement. Now, the bank has never explained exactly what the problem was though uh, because the CBE said the glitch was not as a result of cyber attack and that the customer should not be worried as their personal accounts were intact. So that means it's an in-house kind of thing and the bank is trying to establish uh, what led to the technical glitch to ensure that it doesn't happen again because you want to have the vote of confidence from your clients or those who are having accounts with you. And well, lastly from our business world this morning, let's get into what is happening from the forex market uh, that is uh, current, uh, courtesy of the Bank of Uganda. How will you find the different currencies if you are to exchange this morning? Yesterday, by opening time, the US dollar was buying at 3,886.96 and selling was 3,896.96. Uh, by closing time, uh, buying was 3,876.71 while selling was 3,886.71. The Great Britain pound was buying at 4,905.58 by morning time while selling at 4,918.24. Then the euro was buying at 4,206.23 while selling at 4,217.08. The Kenyan shilling was buying at 29.36 while selling at 29.44. And then the Tanzanian shilling was buying at 1.51 shillings while selling at 1.52 shillings as the South African rand was buying at 205.46 shillings while selling at 205.99 shillings. So that's how you will find the forex market for those who are moving out to trade and exchange some currencies. I'll be back tomorrow to give you more from the world of business. Stick around. Good morning, Uganda continues. Chantal Oliver Cannon is right here to give you traffic updates.
Good morning once again. It's time for us to see how you can make your way to town if you are coming from Nambole side. Boyager side, Chirika side, let's see how traffic is faring as you try to make your way to town. But also, if you're trying to get to Nakawa side, Lugogo side, definitely I'll be filling you in on how you can move just in case you use that route now. From Nambole roundabout, which seems to be free of traffic, you are able to move if you are coming from Nambole side through Chirika. As you can see, when you reach the Junction Mall, you realize that there is a lot of traffic on there. So you might want to prepare for that through Chirika up to Chirika Police Station. Shortly after Chirika Police Station, that is where you will not be finding traffic. And uh, the rest of it moves quite smoothly until you hit the Kampala Ginger Highway. That is where you'll be finding small, small holdups of traffic, but traffic that is not scary. As you can see, you are okay to move all the way until, until you are approaching um, until you are approaching the junction that has spear motors now. That is the spear junction usually. Now traffic is okay. And when you get there, that's where you'll be finding the red zones indicating that there is a lot of traffic. If you're coming from Untinda, you are okay. The holdups in the middle there, of course, which are always there. And not to worry about on a general overview, you are free to move. But at the junction, there's a lot of traffic for you who is coming to town. If you are planning on uh, taking Chinawa Takamuya Road, then uh, you there is not traffic. There is no traffic in the middle there. So in case you want to use that to connect to Mbuya, to connect to to connect to Bugolobi side, you might want to think about that. It might be an easier route to use. However, if we continue all the way going to Nakawa, you realize that there will be some traffic in the middle there, but not much for you to worry about until you reach uh, the first traffic lights at, uh, at, at Nakawa, shortly after Nakawa market. That's where you'll be finding a bit of a holdup. But after that, you are okay to move as you're making your way, uh, as you're making your way to town trying to get to Lugogo side as well. So when you reach the Lugogo lights, you will realize that there is a bit of a holdup and that is because of the lights, definitely. And, uh, but after crossing through, if you're still staying on the Kampala Ginger Highway, no, Ginger Road, pardon me. If you are staying on Ginger Road, you are headed for some bit of holdups in there. It's a bit of a stretch and somewhere as you are closing into the roundabout, the Ginger Road roundabout, there is a lot of traffic. So if you can choose to use another road, I highly recommend that you use that road. But if you're going to 3rd Street, aside from the junction, you are okay to move. And uh, if you are also someone that is uh, going to say forest mode, you will find some bit of holdups in there. On the Lugogo Bypass, as you, when you are coming from Chira Road, uh, you will realize that you are okay to move as you're making your way, uh, as you're making your way to Lugogo side. And pretty much that is how traffic is faring. But if you're trying to proceed to make your way to town, there is holdups, small holdups and big holdups, red zones that are not very many, Crown House side, seems to be okay suits avenue is okay it's not busy all the way until you reach kagen house you are seemingly okay to move until the junction if you're going to william street the junction that leads you there has some bit of traffic uh the side of the independence monument seems okay nile avenue is okay if you are using that route and well fairly that is how far i could make sure that i collect for you this morning if you're trying to make your way to town thank you for staying around Coming up is Good Morning Uganda Agenda. Stay with us. Peak of the day on UBC. Every Wednesday, 10 p.m. on your public broadcaster. was brought to you by MTN Momo Pay is the easy way to pay. Dial star 165 star 3 hash or use the MTN Momo app. You don't need cash. MTN Momo Pay is safe and free. 
Nyati Motion Pictures brings you Tuko Pamoja, a documentary film about our unity as Ugandans and Africans. Bunyoro would have simply created an East African community that we are looking for today. The rulers of Bunyoro are actually Luos. We people who live across the Nile, we are so related from our myth or from just the Nile. Who we are the same people and genetically we are even the same people. We are similar people. We are one. Pamoja, we are one. Use that word, Pamoja. Premiering every week from 3rd February to June 2024 at the National Theatre and Indere Centre. Daily screenings are from 4th February to June 2024 at Ham Cinemax and the National Theatre. To get a ticket, call 0778-787-660. Tuko Pamoja? UBC is the national public broadcaster. We educate, inform, entertain, and inspire our audiences. You can watch us on free-to-air channel 001, DSTV channel 282, GoTV channel 371, Star Times channel 201, Zuku TV channel 20, and Azam TV channel 350. Even when your subscription expires, you can still watch UBC for free on your pay TV platforms. The cardinal role of a government is maintaining law and order, safeguarding citizens' rights and providing essential public goods and services. Throughout its tenure, the government has consistently upheld these principles. This foundation creates an environment conducive to delivering crucial social services to citizens through diverse approaches such as taxation, strategic budgeting, and effective policy implementation. A transformative education system, advancing healthcare provisions, enhancing social welfare, and propelling infrastructure growth, all of which continue to evolve daily to cater to the population's expectations. Supported by a meticulously organized network of ministries, government remains committed to serving its citizens. Coming soon on your public broadcaster, The Front Bench, your interface with the government every Monday at 8.30 p.m. with Joram Paul Sonko, only on your public broadcaster, UBC, inspiring Uganda. A new dawn on Behind the Headlines with me, Timothy Nyangweso, every Wednesday live in our studios in the heart of Kampala, we have conversations that have analysis, explanation, but not every truth is fact and not every fact is truth. Every Wednesday, 10 p.m. on your public broadcaster. All on your public broadcaster, UBC, inspiring Uganda. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Well, thank you for again sticking with us. It is time for Good Morning Uganda Agenda. My name is Olive Monica Najuma. Now, today, we'd like to delve into the events that happened last week in Dokolo, where there was a by-election for, uh, for the post of uh, the woman member of parliament for the area. Now, as we know, in January, we lost uh, Cecilia Ogwal, who was the woman member of parliament, Dokolo, and so the place fell vacant, and uh, we had about seven contenders that were trying to become the representative of uh, the area. And of course, among these, we had a Forum for Democratic Party with a candidate, National Resistance Movement, National Unity Platform Party, and uh, many more. We had two independents that were all contending to become the woman representative for the area. So today we will be delving into multi-party politics and with a special interest 
an overview of the Dokolo by election. Now, to have this conversation with me this morning is a gentleman from uh, the is a, a gentleman from the Uganda People's Congress, the party that won the election. Actually, looking at the numbers, UPC won by quite a huge margin. Sarah, um, Sarah Aguti, who was uh, standing on the Uganda People's Congress card or ticket, won this election with 23,044 votes. Now, the person that came in next to her was uh, NRM's Adong Janet Rose, Elau, with 14,001 votes. And, uh, of course, the next in line was, uh, uh, was uh, Alwok Austin, Ogugwal Rosemary with 8,168 votes and uh, uh, National Unity Platform Party's uh, Ageno Harriet had 727 votes. Now the independents, we had uh, Arao Rebecca with 439 votes and uh, Akulo Esther Obo or bought with 790 votes. Those were the numbers in the Dokolo by election where the winner had 23,044 votes. And this winner was Sarah Aguti from uh, the Uganda People's Congress Party. Now, if you understand Uganda's politics, you know that from inception around the time when we got our independence, one of the major parties of the time was Uganda People's Congress. And uh, it was headed by the first prime minister of Uganda, that was Apollo Milton Obote. And uh, of course, under the leadership of uh, Sir, Apollo uh, Sir, Apollo Sir Edward Motesa, <laughs> I beg your pardon. Mm -hmm. Now, moving forward, we have seen Uganda People's Congress go through ups and downs, challenges and gains. Um, uh, for some people, actually, at some point, they thought that the party had actually gone obsolete. But we know that's not the case because the party is still here. They still have their offices and now they won a major election. A major election where many people from different parties presidents of different parties actually went to the area to canvass for votes for their uh, for their party representatives but then uh, UPC emerged as the winner now I'll be having this conversation with uh, Mr Luanga Christopher Apollo who is the head of ideology research and documentation department and also the head of the ideology school for UPC he is also a community leader Thank Thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. This is, of course, not my first time, yes. and it is not my last time. <laughs> that uh, when I'm invited the, and I'm delivering a, a discussion on my party, it is a very unique moment. However, before I proceed, I have to deliver warm greetings from our party president. Honorable Jimmy Akena, MOP Leader East, from the UPC Fraternity at Uganda House, in the country, and in the diaspora. They are actually listening and following to this program. Mm. Then, as we have already mentioned, that I'm a community leader, I'm an executive member of Kaboja A, LOC1. And I send my warm greetings to my chairman, Magara Flank, and the vice. Uh, Shaban. Then I'm also an executive member elected on UPC ticket, on PWD ticket at Chengera Town Council. So I send also my greetings to Chairman Semanyonyi and the committee members Tebandeke, Mukwaya, Nachigude, and the, our councillor Bizika. Well, thank you uh, so much once again for being here with us. It is exciting, first of all, to have a conversation with someone that is uh, with great experience. From what you mentioned, I can tell that uh, there is a, a lot of experience and you know the story of UPC much more than I can even fathom. So starting from uh, the point where many people thought that UPC had actually become obsolete. 
and for to where you are winning a very major election. I know the story doesn't start in Dokolo. So what has UPC been up to over the last couple of years that has led it, led it to this moment? Actually, before I, I place that button, yes. let me just make one slight clarification. When we went for, for elections leading to independence, we fought those elections on the banner of parliamentary democracy, where each party, which has got the greatest number of MPs in the parliament, would form a coalition with the other ones. However, UPC as a party failed to do a coalition with the Democratic Party after having approached it twice and managed to do a coalition with the KY, Kabaka Ekazi Party. But much as we did that coalition, it was not so easy for Kabaka to become a president. Some reforms had to be made in, in Parliament. And the first president of Uganda on record was the Queen of England, who was being rep represented by uh, Sir Walter Coates as the Governor General. Re reforms had to be made in Parliament. And in November 1963, uh, King Freddy, all the Kabak of Uganda, became the head, uh, the, the president. Okay, so that clarification, people should take note of it. It was not from 1962 mm. that uh, Kabaka started as a president. Kabaka started as a president in 1963, November, when we had done reforms in the parliament. Mm. And we removed the, the Queen of England as the president of Uganda, who was being represented by Sir Walter Coates, the governor general. Okay. Yes. That clarification needs to be understood. And also there is another clarification I need to make towards that. There is always that confusion that in Uganda had two types of independence. One on eighth for Mengo, for Buganda, and one on ninth. It was only the one on ninth. Okay? Mm. And the other clarification I need to make is that uh, the leader of uh, DP, Bendikto Chuanuka, did indeed a peaceful handover after the Apple elections and he called Dr. Apple Milton about that, please, you have defeated me, better take over your government. Mm. And UPC and Dr. Apple Milton about it, formed or started running the government on 1st May 1962. Okay. But the official handing over of instruments of independence was on 9th October 1962. Okay. Okay. So they are very much comfortable mm. with the audience. I've clarified those things. They always cause a lot of confusion in the public domain. Uh, yeah, you have a point because even the way history is taught, yes. it is not explained to the T like you have. Because for most of us, we believe that uh, uh, you got, we became independent in 9th uh, October 1962. Mm -hmm. That is when the first president, uh, the prime minister and the president, that's when they got the, the, the tools of power. But now when you explain it that way, it yes. makes so much yes. sense. Yes. And for all those who are interested in getting all those issues to root to bottom, uh, the ideology school of UPC I had, is very open and it welcomes the new entrance across the political divide. So it's not only limited? Uh, uh, it is not only members. limited. Oh. Because we are nationalists. <laughs> you can't build nationalism alone. Alone. Yes. I, I hear you on yes. that. I now to go that. back to your issue, mm. you were wondering UPC was once a great party, but somewhere it disappeared and it is as if it is re-emerging with a bang. Exactly. Uh, that one mm. is not an easy explanation. I will try to be as brief as possible. Some of us, we got caught up and we have never left the trenches. Mm. Up to now, we are still in the trenches doing the mix. And, this, and the fruits are starting to be seen. Okay. Yeah. The events which led to our being overthrown in the government twice, is also part of this explanation. 
So we went, the, uh, the government was overthrown on 27th July 1985 by the Okelo and Okelos. Being a gunny man, you did not expect democracy to flourish. And they did not hold on power for much longer. They were also overthrown by the current leadership on 26th January 1986. But much as that happened, the, those who overthrew the Okero and Okero were not in for opening up multi-party democracy as quickly as possible. So they came with the, an instrument, all illegal notes number one of 1986 January, which said that all political parties be restricted at your headquarter and nobody should come up with a new political party. All the, the political party activities were suspended and now we started moving in a direction of no party democracy, all individual made it okay mm. now that move, moving from 1986 to 205 okay created the, a big disadvantage because for us we would be known by our symbols we would be known by the nature of the way i dressed but between 1986 to, 2005. to, to 2005 i could not dress like this Okay. If I dressed like this, I would immediately be arrested mm. and charged mm. that I'm, I'm against the law of the land. However, me from 1988 December, I, I, I left Uganda mm. and I went to Zambia. Mm. Then as I went in Zambia, it led me now to meeting our founding father, Dr. Apollo Milton Obote, yes. and who adopted me as his humble student. And he mentored me all through, and he was so much interested in me learning as much as possible about Uganda and about Africa. And let me say this very openly. In that very school of Dr. Apollo Milton Obote, where we are, where we are learning issues under his feet, even uh, Honorable Jimmy Akena, the current UPC party president, was one of the students. Interesting. Yes. Others are like Professor Medikwesiga in South Africa. We are so many, even Joseph Ochieno. We are quite many, mm. okay, youth of that time. And... Uh, our lack of getting involvement in the direct politics was more of the laws which were pertaining in Uganda. And, yeah. and at that end, where we are in Zambia, mm. we are trying to mount pressure mm. to see that uh, the political space opens up. And once it, is, once it opens up, mm. we are ready to do our contribution. So now it's been years since uh, yes. the referendum and multi-party politics yes. was allowed in the country. Yes. And yet, UPC has still been struggling. Yeah, it has to struggle. Because why has it has to struggle? Mm. Okay, The generation which helped UPC to gain power for the first time in 1962 continued to do its politics. Part of that generation was caught up by Amin and they died. Part of it now was caught up with the changes which came and it aged. By the time multi-party politics was introduced in 2006, mm. very few of the voters who voted for UPC in 1980 were still very strong to even to chase an animal. Most of them had become old, okay? And this is where some of us, we are now coming in. Okay. We depended more on theory, okay? Mm. And we did not understand what was in the political landscape. So, my supervisor in Zambia, because in Zambia was an expert teacher, uh, understood the greater picture and the greater role I was playing. And I was given a vacational leave, such that in 2006, I did not just depend on theory. Mm. I came on the ground 
and I did the campaigns for Buga in Buganda for Mama Miria, who was our flag bearer. Yes. And I moved on to do campaigns in the municipality for my comrade in arms, yes. Honor Boji Makena. Yes. And good enough, we managed to make it. Mm -hmm. Then from there, okay, we realized that there is a big challenge. And we started a long journey of solo searching. Okay, and, that, and that's why I'm very happy that UBC has given me this opportunity. Mm -hmm. This solo searching now became very complicated. Meetings were held, uh, lecturers were invited until our delegation of UPC senior members, about eight, went to Germany to meet a sister ideological political party, the Social Democrats. When they, they, they reached Germany, the challenge was how are we, can we rebuild the UPC? And we are told that the only way to rebuild the UPC is to teach its ideology and to teach its history. Then they came back here. Uh, when Boji Makena followed it more, and now he asked himself, who among here can he teach this history and ideology of UPC? By that time, I had reallocated myself to Southern Sudan, Equatorial State, and Tolita was still teaching. Then he had to make arrangements to invite me back home full time now. Mm. When I landed, he said, my friend, the task on the table is design something and start teaching the ideology of the party and the history of the party. Okay. So that was precisely 2009, 2010. And I'm happy to, to tell you that all these miracles now you are seeing mm. are partly associated with the graduates of that generation. So basically what you're saying is that the School of Ideology yes. for UPC yes. has set off a series of events yes. that have led the party yes. to the win that we saw last yes. week. Yes, and that's why you are hosting he, me here as a very important person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> However, it was very difficult mm. for, 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 for the party to entirely buy that new idea, mm. that ideology. But I have to thank the Secretary General of that time, who is Chris Opoka Okumu, when we had a delegate conference in Nambole, which led to the, uh, to the election of uh, Dr. Olaro Tunu as a new party president. This idea of uh, working on ideology and on the history of the party mm. was formally adopted. Okay. But much as it was adopted, it could not be well received. We by had the, by everyone. Others at first thought, I'm building a super army. Mm. Okay. Um, it was very difficult to appreciate at the beginning. Mm. But uh, when we did some outreaches, I think it was in 2010 there in Soroti, with the younger men I had trained. Some came from Bushenyi, Busoga, Buganda, and they appeared in the Teso sub region in Soroti to be very specific. We, we took over the entire media houses and the people realized that there is a, a rebirth of UPC somewhere. So this is what UPC has been up to. There yes. has been sensitizing. Yes, sensitizing. And yes. of the masses. And I'm, I'm the midwife <laughs> because the people in Soroti reached an extent that, ah, uh -uh, we have seen these cadres. They have done their part. Mm. But who is the, the one in charge? Mm. So where I was resting, they had to fish me. And they tipped me that it is a big fight. Your boys have put up a fight. Now they want to crush the master. Now, I did a fantastic job. And they said, ah, ah, we are not convinced. We are going to bring the big guns and we, we flag you down. I said, you bring your big guns. I'm here. I'm working for the party. So they brought the big guns and we are on this radio of Mukula. Is, is it uh, Teso FM or Solot FM? Then the people had to come to the studio to see who are these people representing UPC. That is showing you a, a flash that UPC is back on the road. So basically, okay. uh, what, the, to the people yes. that uh, were thinking that uh, UPC is done for, 
this is basically a message of we have been working behind yeah. the curtains mm. and now we are more empowered, we yes. are more powerful than we used to be. So basically people who want to be under the party, this is your message to yes. them. But and, I would like for and us it to... would be unfair if I don't again complete this thing. Mm. I made the story of this, okay? Some party members adopted the strategy of always taking the party to the courts of law. Mm. And I must say this, the judiciary, they are civil servants, they are not practical politicians. Mm -hmm. You would take there a case, they would look at it from that angle. They are not but politicians, yes, they would look at it from, a from that angle. Politics. And they would even make a decision that you go back to your party, mm. okay, and resolve issues. Now our people, once they are told to go back to, to the party and resolve issues, that meant that you called a Supreme Party organ. They would not do that. Instead, they would file another fresh case. Mm. So for a good number of years, UPC was bogged down with the court cases. Till through the wisdom and the visionary of our party president said enough of those court cases. I'm going now for a political solution. Let me mobilize the people, okay? Mm -hmm. And the people will determine the destiny of UPC and the country. So now, he shifts his attention from court cases mm -hmm. and goes to mobilize the people, to chat with the people, to converse with the people, to rehearse with the people, to focus with the people, okay? And having come from the background, of high-sounding nationalism, high-sounding pan-Africanism, and internationalism. It was easy to have a message which cuts across. Throughout that time, he has been in the trenches. So now, an opportunity came through a very unfortunate circumstance yes. when a minister was assassinated. Okay? This was Oyam. Mm. And Oyam gave us a, a first class laboratory of where to put all our ideas as a party. And the starting idea was let Oyamu North constituency give us a candidate. And when it came to giving us a candidate, there was a contestation. Till they said, you know, this contestation previously caused us problems. You who are vowing for this post, can't you sit and agree? So they sat by consensus and gave us Dr. Eunice appeal. And we said, this is now our present. So we, we called on all our players we had trained mm. and we assembled the campaign machine. And that campaign machine subordinated itself to the party president that he will be the overall leader. And we worked out a message. You remember these by-elections where you are doing it not because the members crossed from another party, but uh, somebody has died under such circumstances. You have really to package a message which does not offend because the feelings are still very high. Mm. So we did that. And Actually, we pulled uh, it through. Uh, yes, and uh, I'm curious to know yes. how the party prioritized its messaging to resonate with voters in yeah. the constituency. Now we are now focusing back at the Dr. Yeah. Yes. by-election. Be because now when we go to Oyamu North by-election, mm. is that regardless of what they say, okay, the UPC history, the UPC legacy, the UPC ideology stands tall, okay? It has been just unfortunate that it had not been told to the public so this and is to what the party members. To so we packaged a message, okay, mm. based on our previous record and based on what is existing, okay? Uh, out of that, they realized that indeed it is better to try UPC in Oyamu North. And uh, 
since it was a by-election, when others are resting, the ears and the eyes were wide mm -hmm. open. And as the ears and the eyes were wide open, people did not sleep. They waited for the final results to be announced. And when the final results were announced, some of our traditional support bases, which had gone quiet, silent, they woke up like in Chitugumu. People just marched on the street. And the next few days, they were now sending buses and buses of the delegation to, to, to Lira, to, 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 to Lango, to pay homage. Then in the cavalry, everybody was jumping up. I want us to now go back to Dokolo. Yes. I understand what yes. happened in Oyam. Yes. But now, has, was the same, are the same events that uh, led to a win in Oyam the same that catapulted the, UPC into a winning position? The lessons we week. drew from Oyam yes. helped us to consolidate ourselves in Dokolo. Mm -hmm. Because the campaign machine was well oiled yes. and already intact. And you could not find the double tanks. They all said now, our Mugole, or our candidate, is Sarah Ogutu. Mm. Who is uh, presenting him is Honorable Jime Akena. Then, as you are asking Dokoro, something unique happened, mm -hmm. which is also related. The Electoral Commission released a roadmap. And when a roadmap was released, some politicians traversed the country. Now, our leader, Honorable Jim Akena, said, no, charity starts at home. And it starts his formal mobilization in Apache and Kwania. And as he started his formal mobilization in Apache and Kwania, the people asked him a direct question. Come 2026, are you on a ballot paper? And you also and answered the answer them. To that? Yes, if you are supporting me, I'm on the ballot paper. The whole crowd got charged. Okay, now still, <laughs> uh, still back to the by election. Yes. <laughs> Interesting take, but still back to the by election. With uh, any election, there are key points of focus. Yes. And I believe that different, may, uh, different contestants had different areas of focus. Yes. What did UPC focus on mainly when it was talking and yeah. to the voters and also traversing different areas for now, votes? Now let me bring it closer, okay? Mm. From Kwania and Apache, the campaign trail of national mobilization shifted to Amarata. Mm -hmm. Amarata is in the neighborhood of Dokoro, mm -hmm. okay? And the momentum gained. They asked him the same question. Are you on a ballot paper come 2026? He said, if you are supporting me, I'm there. The, now, that message started going beyond the Amarata and the Lango sub-region. Now, under a few weeks before the death of our Ioni Lady Mama, Cecilia Timo Gwai, Honorable Boji Makena and his UPC national mobilization machine visited Dokolo for the mobilization without knowing that the catastrophe was we, going to we, Yes. And the ground was overcharged. Mm -hmm. And when people receive Honorable Jim Akena in wherever he goes, they also stand up with their lineup of 2026. Okay? From LC1 to the district. So my takeaway is, yes. in, as, uh, in as much as the by-election came, yes. UBC, uh, UPC had already done the ground work. Yeah, it had already so people done. people were already excited and uh, for lack of a better word, receptive of mm. UPC and its ideology. That is exactly what had transpired. And that nagging question, remember UPC did not put up a party president, a, a presidential candidate in 2016, neither did it put up a presidential candidate in, in 2021. Mm. So some UPC members were disillusioned and some UPC members had been fed on lies that the Honorable Jim Akena may be struck a silent deal 
and ate something, he's not ready to compete. Because if he competes, he can disturb the status quo. Now, so, since all those uh, uh, national mobilization tours I have mentioned in Apache, mm. in Amarata, and in Dokoro itself, he was answering that question explicitly in clear terms. Now, people knew that their chances of moving forward when we have a presidential flag bearer are much higher. All right. Okay. Now, that, putting that into perspective, yes. and uh, the recent wins, the Oyam win, the Dokolo win, how does uh, the party plan to build on the results from these, from these recent wins for future success, successes in elections? Actually, we are going to even double the effort. Okay. Because we are seeing the fruits, uh, the, hard, the hard work we had put in is repaying. Mm. And is repaying in, 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 in a bigger way than we had anticipated. Mm. Because why I want to tell you this, it is very, very difficult to come out of the by-elections. And when it came to Kudokolo by-elections, the stakes were very high. Extremely and I had high. never been worried of any campaign and any competition like the one of Dokoro. You may ask why, why? you were a man from the trenches. Why are you worried of Dokoro? Why were you worried Dokoro, of Dokoro? remote as it is, the stakes were very high. First and foremost, we had a biggest threat from FDC in Najanankumbi. FDC in Najanankumbi, they were the incumbents. Mama Cecilia Timogwara had crossed from UPC to independent to FDC. FDC. And okay. their representative happened to be her daughter. Yes. And we know that in recent by-elections where a member of parliament died, in most cases, the child of uh, that member of parliament, if they stood, they won. But the people from Lango sub-region, they have not bought that. <laughs> they again defeated it in Oyamu North. But now when I tried to do our field research, mm. why is the FDC so much determined to win Dokoro? We realized that it is part of the answer to their current wrangles they are in. If they win Dokoro, they reassure everybody that we are in the driving seat, we are in charge, come 2026, roll back behind us. And for them, they did not even wait for the formal announcement of the calendar of, from the electoral commission. Mm. They started their groundwork early. And as they started their groundwork early, they even of dramatized it higher. Because there are even special tracks they faded from Kampala where people stand as if it is a caravan, okay, to take that in a rural constituency and they moved door to door. But for us, we remained very steady. Then at the same time also, the, the ruling party, would it be very much comfortable to be defeated by UPC in Oyamu North, then UPC follows with another defeat in Dokolo, and 2026 is nearing? I won't, won't they be putting themselves in an awkward position? So you could see that even the ruling party was interested in winning Dokolo than any other constituency. Well, then then how would it mm, play mm. in the Lango politics? Remember, this is a, a woman uh, council race, and Dokoro has two constituencies which are not controlled by UPC. Now, those two constituencies, would they follow along the way? Because the people who have voted are also the ones who vote in those two constituencies. So the stakes were very high if you analyze it. 
Well, indeed, the yes. stakes were high, but Uganda People's Congress made news and, of course, made a comeback with their candidates winning over 24,000, 23,000 over the vote. And, of course, the person who followed from the ruling party had 14,000 votes. Now, that's no small feat. And from what Mr. Rwanga has shared with us, it is that uh, they have been doing the groundwork. They have been uh, sensitizing and educating the masses about the UPC ideology. Now, 2026 is around the corner. Who is going to take over that region? And of course, they have already noted to us that they are going to be on a ballot, on the ballot, that Jimmy Akena will be on the ballot coming 2026. Now, Uganda has multi-party politics, and every party is allowed to present a candidate that they see fit to represent them. I think that 2026 is going to be very interesting. And as for Uganda People's Congress, we say congratulations to Sarah Aguti, who won the Dokolo Woman Member of Parliament race. And uh, Mr. Ranga, thank you so much for sparing time to speak with us and sharing that history of uh, UPC with us. You are welcome. Every time there is an opportunity, feel free to invite me, even at a short note. Most definitely. UPC is always here to serve the public. Most definitely. And of course, good morning, Uganda. We are here to entertain you, inform you, and have discussions with policy makers and opinion leaders in our country. So stick around. We still have so much more coming your way. And of course, uh, Ruben Pima is coming through with uh, sports updates. Don't go away. <laughs>